Hello, my name is Pastor Rick Dykeman. It's my privilege to welcome you to this online worship gathering of Ada Congregational Church. We're so glad you could be with us here today. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, we pray that you would experience God's welcome here with a group of people committed to doing our best to love all, welcome all, and seek justice for all. Today is the final Sunday in our lengthy fall series, Faces of Our Faith, the bold and untold stories, where we looked at some lesser known uh, scripture stories. We're wrapping that up today, and then we turn our eyes next week towards Thanksgiving and then toward Advent, which is hard to even imagine, uh, but here we go. Today is also a day where we celebrate all saints, where we remember those who have gone before, those who have impacted our lives, those whose stories continue to impact our individual and community stories as a church family. And so as we lean into that, I invite you to read together this responsive call to worship. In Luke's gospel, Jesus called together the disciples and a great multitude to a level place. There he touched, he healed, and he taught. There he spoke, blessed are, and then he named the blessed, the saints of the faith. O God, call us together as you did those so long ago to discover your blessed people. Today in this place, Christ, gather us. Let us remember, celebrate, and embody the blessed saints of God. Christ, come among us. Amen. Oh, 
Welcome, friends. Today, we are celebrating or honoring All Saints Day. All Saints Day in the church calendar is November 1. And on this day, we remember our loved ones and friends who have died throughout this past year. Now the word saint has many meanings. And as we gather as followers of Jesus today, we are remembering that God makes us saints or holy people. It's not dependent upon what we do or the actions or the words we say. It is simply a gift given to us as followers of Jesus through the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of Jesus provided for on the resurrection that we can claim the name of saint and that we entrust our loved ones as saints to God when they have died. So today, we are going to say the names of those ones who have died this past year and light a candle in their memory. And as we do so, we light them from the light of Christ to remind us that God's light, the light of Christ is in them in all places and all times. And as the Bible says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness shall never overcome it. Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor in spirit, for yours is the dominion of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the human one. Jesus named the blessed ones. On this day of remembrance, let us recall and give thanks for those blessed ones who have gone before us. Mark Wagner, father of Emily Linnert. David Andrus, brother of Barry Andrus. Dahlia Flaggart, granddaughter of Barb Flaggart. Diane Bialk, sister of Larry Bialk. Eleanor Dykema, grandmother of Rick Dykema. Richard Flynn, husband of Julie. Stephanie Witt, wife of Gil. Edna Martin, Susan Martin's mother. Cal Shop, Susan Martin's husband. Jack Scripsma, father of Carrie and Brian today. Joe Nelson, husband of June Nelson. Eldon Carlson, father of Kyle Carlson. Carolyn Kaiser, sister of Gretchen Vandenberg. Greg Adams, friend of K and J Barber. Karen Chernak, aunt of Stacy Aldred. Peter Dam. Stepfather of Greg Hughes. Lillian Bosher, mother of Bonnie Fleetum. Dale David Stuhl, father of Susie Duma. 
This final candle that we light is in honor of all the unnamed persons whom we carry in our hearts and whose stories are with us. Let us ponder the light in silence. Please join me in an echo prayer. Living God, we give you thanks for our loved ones. Keep them forever in your arms. May they stay forever in our hearts. Amen. from the book of Acts 16. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Thamatrace and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the gate by the river where we supposed there was a place of prayer we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman was named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Tyrethin, a dealer of purple cloth. The Lord opened, our, opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful, to the Lord, come and stay at my home. She prevailed upon us. After leaving the prison, we went to Lydia's home, and when they had seen and encouraged the brothers and sisters there, they departed. This is our final week in our series, Faces of Our Faith, the bold and untold stories, where we've looked at lesser known characters from the Bible. And today, we talk about Lydia from Acts 16. And if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Luke wrote the gospel according to Luke, which is about the life and ministry, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And then he also wrote kind of a second volume of his works, which is called Acts or Acts of the Apostles. And that's basically the history of the early church. What happened in those couple of decades after Jesus' death and resurrection? And Jesus commands his disciples. He gives them the great commission. Go, therefore, into all the world, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Start in Jerusalem and Judea and then Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus tells his disciples to start local, but bring good news everywhere you go. And, and the story of the book of Acts follows that geographic movement from the center in Jerusalem out towards the ends of the earth. And here by the middle of the book in Acts 16, the apostle Paul is already on his second missionary journey. He's traveled through Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And now he's 
close to the Aegean Sea. And he has this vision just before what we read. He has a vision of a man from Macedonia, that is modern day Greece, beckoning him saying, come, come and help us. And so it says the next day he got up and made plans. And this is their journey then to Macedonia. Our reading began, we therefore set sail from Troas, took a straight course to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis. These are probably not three places you've spent a lot of time thinking about. But the next one might sound more familiar. He says, and from there, Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for several days, Luke says. So Luke is a personal traveling partner, a companion of the Apostle Paul at this point. So he's using personal pronouns, we, us, this is what we did next. But they go to Philippi, just north of the Aegean Sea in Macedonia or Greece. Philippi is a big city. It's a Roman colony. That's a big deal. It's on the Via Ignatia. It's an ancient Roman road, a, a, an ancient trade route. It's, it's right on the main road across the Roman Empire. So it's a place of trade, place of people traveling, metropolitan area. We know it because there's a book in our New Testament called The Letter to the Church at Philippi. Often we call it Philippians. So this is the beginning of that church that Paul later writes a letter to called Philippians. Our reading continued, and on the Sabbath day, we, Luke and Apostle Paul and others, we went outside the gate by the river where we supposed there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the people gathered there. So Paul and his companions, they go outside the city gate to a place that they supposed is a place of prayer. Now that phrase might not mean much to us, but that's a way of saying a synagogue, a group of people gathered who are either Jewish ethnically or following the Jewish faith, interested in the God of Israel. And so they're looking for a place like a synagogue where people are gathered following in the way of the God of Israel. But it's not just people gathered there. It says, we spoke to the women who had gathered there. Here is yet another story in this series where the women are lifted up. It says, a certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God was listening to us. She, this Lydia, was from Thyatira and was a dealer in purple cloth. Now, purple cloth was rare. It's difficult to make purple in the ancient days. And so purple goods were luxurious. They were a big deal, tough to come by. They indicated affluence or influence too. Royalty, wealth, status, a certain status. If you have purple robe, oh my goodness. Lydia's a dealer in purple cloth. So it's likely she had wealth. We also hear that Lydia is a worshiper of God. She's a Gentile, she's, she's not Jewish, but she's following the God of this people. She's a worshiper of God. And then Luke lets us know that the Lord opened her heart to listen to us, to e- listen eagerly to what Paul was saying. When she and her household were baptized, we don't, we don't get much of a conversion experience or Luke's got a lot of things to say, and so he's, he's getting through the details quick. But it says, the Lord opened her heart. She was listening eagerly. And when her whole household was baptized, <laughs> and he just blows through what happened in between there. But when she was baptized and her whole household, she urged us saying, if you have judged me faithful, then come and stay at my home. And so then the Bible talks about her home. Her home, not not the man in her life, but her home. And she invites them in. Later, this home would become the house church for the early Christians there. It's 
possible that when Paul wrote the letter to the Philippians, that church was read in Lydia's home. Two scholars, Divine and Ayayo, say Lydia's ability to offer lodging in her home to numerous guests and the subsequent use of her home as a house church, well, that indicates that her wealth was greater than that of the average Macedonian at that time. It's not even clear that this residence in Philippi is her primary residence. As a wealthy merchant, it's very possible that she could have maintained a second residence here for business purposes. But the Bible talks about her home and her household. It's interesting to note, no man is mentioned. Lydia is the head of this household. Interesting, yet again, in this day and age when when misogyny, when, when patriarchy was the norm. Several chapters earlier, we hear about Cornelius and his entire household being baptized. I think that's in Acts 10. But salvation comes to the family through her, her household. There's no man mentioned. And as salvation comes to the family, it's worth noting, comes to the family. Luke doesn't say she accepted Jesus as her personal Lord and Savior. There's nothing personal happening here. It's communal. It's much less individualized than the way we think of faith. When I was a kid, we were taught you, when you get on your knees potentially and, and accept the Lord into your heart and, and accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, those are the phrases we use, but it's, it's personal. It's, it's a personal decision that I make and faith then is my relationship with God. It's, it's not communal necessarily, it's personal. But here in the scriptures, they talk about entire households being welcomed into the faith, salvation coming to Lydia's to Lydia and her entire household. When her household was baptized, it says. There's a communal nature that, that you're joining something, that you're participating in something bigger than yourself. It's communal. And then we skipped a whole bunch of verses where Paul and his partner Silas, they end up in prison. And if they get beaten, they're stuck in prison. And eventually uh, the magistrates discover that Paul and Silas are Roman citizens and they should never have been beaten and held in prison without a trial. And so they sheepishly escort Paul and Silas out. And they go back then to Lydia's home. And our reading ended in verse 40. After leaving the prison, they went to Lydia's home. And when they had seen and encouraged the brothers and sisters there, they departed. So that's the story of Lydia. That's the beginning of the church at Philippi, the Philippian church. Over the last couple of months, we've looked at lots of different stories. Stories of faith and faithfulness. We looked at Shipra and Pua, two Hebrew midwives enslaved in Egypt, and they were faithful. And then Deborah, a prophetess and judge in ancient Israel, and she was faithful. And Anna, a prophetess who worked tirelessly, continuously lived at the temple around the time of Jesus' birth. And she gives a prophecy about Jesus. And Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy, affluent member of the Jerusalem council, the Sanhedrin, who was a secret follower of Jesus and then went very public after Jesus' crucifixion when he goes to Pontius Pilate and asks if he could be allowed to take Jesus' body down off the cross and bury it in his own tomb. Again, faithful. And an Ethiopian eunuch, a racial and sexual minority, somebody outside, other than, discriminated against, ostracized potentially, not fully able to be part of the family of God, who asked this question, what's preventing me from being baptized? And Philip baptizes him, and he's included in the family. And last week, Pastor Rebecca 
talked about Mary Magdalene, one of the closest, we think, followers of Jesus. Again, women being lifted up. Again, a story of faithfulness. And now today, Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth, who is baptized and offers her own home for Paul and Silas and Luke and the group. And then becomes, we think, a leader of that early church in Philippi. Some of these folks were outsiders. Some of them had a bit more affluence and influence. There's people all along the social spectrum. But what unites these stories from more than a thousand years, these stories are are separated by more than a thousand years and are separated from us by 2000 years. These are old stories. But what, what unites these stories is that these folks were faithful. Regardless of their situation in life, they faithfully follow God. They live into that faithfulness. And there's a broad spectrum in these stories. Sometimes in our day, faith and religion get squished into this is the only way, or this is the right way, or this is the norm. Don't you want to be normal? Don't you want your life to fit into this mold, to be in this box? And so there's pressure to be a certain way. That's not just religious pressure. Obviously, there's, there's all sorts of pressure in our culture to look a certain way, act a certain way, have the certain things, be the certain person. Pressure to conform. Do you ever feel like your life doesn't fit the norm? Do you ever feel that there must be something more than this box? Me too. It's the biggest stories that often catch the most attention. It's the loud, the obnoxious, the people with a, with a platform, the people with a microphone, the people with a big Twitter following. They get a lot of the news. But most of us don't have that. We have plenty of privilege and most watching this, if we have the internet and a phone, I mean, we have some influence and some affluence, but, but we're not all spiritual giants or political giants or cultural, you know, icons. Most of us are just trying to get through today and thinking a little bit about tomorrow and trying to keep everybody safe and figure out how to get enough sleep. <laughs> And in the midst of all of that, I think that what I'm taking away from this series, from these stories of faithful folks, I'm taking away that there's a lot of room for your story and for my story. There's room at the table for you and for I. You and I may not be typical. We may not fit the mold or the norm or be in the box. But what even is that? You and I, we all have special gifts. We're all created in God's image. And so you matter. You are worthy. And you are loved. What if it's not really about superhuman accomplishments or extraordinary faith or looking just perfect? What if instead it's the little things? Ordinary people living faithfully. I wonder. I wonder if that's enough. Ordinary people living faithfully, part of a community that's doing its best to live faithfully. Extravagant welcome and inclusion. 
radical hospitality, welcoming all, loving all, and seeking justice for all. As we seek to live out our own stories of faith, may those stories be marked by faithfulness. Amen.
please join in our congregational prayer. Eternal God, we give you thanks for the founders of your church, for those whom you called and formed in the image of your Son, for those who suffered and died for their faith. We thank you for the cloud of witnesses. We give you thanks for the reformers of your church, for the rediscovery of knowledge, for their faithful study of your word, for their endeavor to serve their neighbors. God of our ancestors, give us the courage and wisdom of the saints who have gone before us. Form us in the image of your Son. Renew your Holy Spirit's work in our generation. May we live and serve following the example of Jesus Christ. Hear our prayers this day for our church family. Be with those who are ill and those who tend to their side. Be with children of ailing parents and parents of ailing children. Comfort those who grieve. Give strength and courage where needed, O Lord. Bless the recent refugee family who arrived in Grand Rapids. Wrap your arms around them in this new environment. Ease their spirits during this transitional period. Guide our church as we strive to be instruments of your peace and make us ever aware of our calling to welcome all in your name. Guide us, O oh God, through this upcoming election. Touch our hearts and minds with your wisdom. Give us the gracious voices to hear and open ears to learn more and be more. May there be civility in this land. Thank you, eternal God, for your steadfastness. As we experience the changing season, the diminishing of daylight and the colder temperatures, we are confident of your unchanging presence. You are with us both now and forever, just as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, the light of your love is shining In the midst of the darkness shining Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us Set us free by the truth you now bring us Shine on me Shine on me Shine, Jesus, shine Fill this light Father's glory, lay, Spirit, lay, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, I come to your some presence from the shadows into your radiance by the blood i may enter your brightness search me try me consume all my darkness shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine fill this land with the father's glory And now, may you go into the world living a life, living a story filled with faith and faithfulness. 
ordinary people doing little things with love. Grace and peace, friends. Amen.